Good evening. My name is Eric Kirk. This is Redwood Wonk. I'm with Aaron Donaldson this week. Dave is taking a break. Um, we are, we've got so much news um, this week. Of course, Roe v. Wade is now dead as a matter of law after um, you know so five decades. Um, it, there is no longer a federal uh, guarantee against the enslavement of women by state governments uh, for the duration of pregnancy. I mean, there is no other way to term that. That is what has happened. The, um, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not the decision itself was properly worded. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg had said that it should have been based on equal protection rather than a substantive due process. I actually disagree with that, although I have said on this show that I think she is the most brilliant justice we have ever had. Um, I actually believe that it, on substantive due process in the Ninth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment, it should have been upheld because you know the Ninth Amendment does guarantee rights that are not specifically enumerated. That's what the Ninth Amendment is all about. Um, and we're, we can get into that discussion, um, you know, but Clarence Thomas uh, has made a broad uh, stroke in his, um, his, uh, his supporting opinion. Um, he's the only one signing on to it, but he wants to go after other rights that the Supreme Court has decided um, that are not specifically enumerated in the Constitution. And I, you know, we can get into all the news of it and the political reaction and what the Democrats are going to do about it, what the Republicans are going to do about it, the political fallout. But I really want to explain real quickly the legal uh, implications of all of this. Um, basically, in 1972, the, it was decided on the basis of um, well, there were actually it was a there were several different opinions. There was no more majority opinion. There were several plurality opinions. And the main one was that uh, although there was no specific right to have an abortion specifically in the Constitution, there was a general right to privacy based on, on the Ninth Amendment, which basically states that any rights retained by the people that are not specifically enumerated shall basically be recognized. And, um, and we have a due process uh, clause in the 14th Amendment, which basically states that if that shall extend to the states, that um, that they, it shall not be denied. So the conservative interpretation of the Ninth Amendment is the people means the state, so therefore it's got to be retained by the states, therefore uh, the federal government just can't intrude upon the states. But that that is completely erroneous. I'm sorry, that for, the, for, for somebody like Clarence Thomas, who was a literalist to say that, to say the people means the states, when right in the very next Tenth Amendment, it explicitly says the states. Why, why it would say the people in the Ninth Amendment and then the states in the Tenth Amendment is just completely incomprehensible. Um, and the Tenth Amendment is actually the amendment that says that the federal government can intrude upon the states. So I, I just this is a really bad reasoning here on the part of um, of the conservative majority of the court. I don't even want to call it conservative. That's not even accurate. This is radicalism. Um, so basically, he wants to go after other rights that have been guaranteed by the court that are not specifically enumerated, such as, well, uh, the, the right that allows him to be in an interracial marriage, loving. Um, that's not, there's no right to interracial marriage um, in, in in the Constitution. There is no right to contraception. There is no right to privacy which is what the contraception Griswold versus Connecticut was based on, which was the precursor to Roe v. Wade. There is no right to marry, to have, to marry the person of your choice, which of course was a more recent decision. He's not talking about overturning other cases that have been decided on, on, on these bases. There's a case that's over a hundred years old in which case of the conservative majority way back then said that there's an inherent right to contract. Um, there is another case that's not a Supreme Court, case but never got overturned that there's an inherent right to travel these you know the right to privacy was considered by the plurality opinion to be based on the penumbra of of the bill of rights and 
We'll get into it, but I want to let Aaron come in here and I'll come back to this point. But this is, you know, this, this is something that requires a lot of discussion. And, you know, we don't have we only have an hour in this show. So I'm going to let Aaron jump in here. Well, it's really profound. It is absolutely shocking. And it's a move that has really reverberated across this country. Women, <laughs> people. People with wombs all over the nation are living in a state of genuine fear right now. And I think that while there's lots of things that we can talk about in terms of like how this can affect the coming midterms, how this could be repealed, how, you know, there's ways that we can band together to try to solve this. For the short term, the most um, drastic consequence is going to be just the immediate impact that this is going to have on so many families, on so many young people, um, on, on every American in some form or another. When you take a look at the way that you know sexual and reproductive rights are imbricated into just the living republic as we understand it. For me, one of the most galling parts of this most recent decision was Alito's section where he talks about, as you're saying, Eric, uh, he says the Constitution makes no reference to abortion and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision, including the one which the defenders of Roe and Casey now chiefly rely. Um, he says that provision uh, has guaranteed uh, that some rights are not mentioned in the Constitution, but any such right must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. And if you do your history, you will understand that sexual and reproductive health care and rights are deeply rooted in our yes. nation's history and tradition. Yes. If we go back to when we wrote the Constitution and women were not considered full citizens, then of course they're not going to be deeply rooted in our constitution. Black folks were not deeply rooted in our constitution. And I right. think that we understand this oversight very, very clearly. And for someone like Alito to say that this should be tossed back to the states because from his seat, he doesn't understand that it is in fact deeply rooted in our nation's history um, is very shocking. And it shows, as you say, a very radical court that is willing right. to pick and choose and interpret the words that they want to fit a very specific agenda that is not only at odds with the American people, but it's, at odds with much of the testimony that they gave when they were um, nominated to be elected as justices. Yeah, it's also be noted that there were few, if any, anti-abortion laws back then because, right. you know. It, it didn't, right. They didn't even think about it. But well, you talked ahead. about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Ruth Bader, as, as you probably know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg later in her life says that she wished that the Susan, Susan Strzok case would have been the one that the Supreme Court heard instead of Roe v. Wade. There's a very good on the media episode on this right now, and it talks about how Susan Strzok was an Air Force captain who wanted to remain in the Air Force. But the, the military said that you either have to get an abortion or you have to leave the armed services. So at the time and still now, you can get an abortion on a military base as a way of staying in the army if you are a woman or a person with a womb who becomes pregnant. And Susan Strzok would have set a, a precedent that relies very explicitly on liberty and very explicitly on, on an individual right. Uh, the feeling was at the time the court never would have sided with Strzok. Getting Roe across the, the board was itself a, a monumental <laughs> challenge. So um, – you know, I, I think that the, the the way that we've interpreted this debate from the very, very beginning has been very precarious. And now I think we're seeing uh, the consequences of not doing more to protect this over the years. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, people are talking about, oh, we need to codify it. Um, right. And I, I think we need to do that. You know, to the degree that Congress can do that. But the same Supreme Court can overturn on that basis. Federal right. over or even if they really want to go very radical um, to, uh, you know, uh, the, the right to life of, uh, of a self splitting fetus, you know, I'm right. sorry, they could probably end up doing that. So, right. um, because right now, Congress, the Republicans in Congress are talking about a federal ban. You know, we, we talk about right now, they're talking states' rights, but right. they are now talking about the reverse, a federal ban. They're talking about it 15 weeks. There's several very nefarious talking points going around right now. Um, I listen to a lot of Fox News. I pay a lot of attention to the arguments that are going on in the conservative mm -hmm. sphere as part of my job as a debate coach to make sure I understand all of the argument. And um, a lot of people right now are saying that this is not a ban, that no one is banning anything. And that is one deeply disingenuous to the lack of access that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of Americans are facing when it comes to closing of clinics um, just right down the center of this country. 
country uh, through so-called trigger laws and things like that. Um, there is banning going on. It is very explicit. It is very strategic. It's very forward thinking. And again, for folks to say, you know, first that this is not part of our national tradition, um, I think that's just disingenuous when we look at our practice, uh, not only as individuals, but also as a state. Um, this is part of our national tradition. And to say yeah. that this is not a, a, a forward moving ban is disingenuous. The strategy here has been very, very clear. Um, the, the religious right has been nothing if not explicit that their um, plan is to use the church to inform the state and to make sure that um, practices such as abortion uh, are banned, same-sex marriage are banned. Uh, yeah. Bobert has said recently she does not understand the separation of church and state. She says it's not in the Constitution. She says it's right. in a letter. Um, this, you know, this shows us that this is just the first step. And while we can hope to pack the court and we can hope to enshrine this in law and we could potentially pass a, a constitutional amendment, these are all things that we want people to do. These are yeah. long-term plans, and we're facing a lot of crisis between now and then. Yeah, a uh, constitutional amendment is the route to go. You know, when Roe v. Wade passed, and sometimes we, I, I need to, I'm actually want to work on a history because a lot of people don't understand. Roe v. Wade passed, and a couple of years later in Ca California, we passed Proposition Seven. People don't know that history, but that's when we introduced uh, privacy to the um, to the California Constitution. That secured the right to uh, reproductive rights in, in California. I know they want to put it on the ballot here. I think that's more symbolic than anything else to to put implicit, explicitly put reproductive rights. I think that's more performative and, and symbolic than anything else because women do have the rights under that. But it's um, but that they didn't want to take any chances because immediately there were talks of overturning Roe v. Wade. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, but it, anyway, it's, um, we, we do need a privacy amendment in the Constitution, but that takes three quarters of the states and two thirds of Congress. It would be monumental. And when you look yeah. at the American Legislative Exchange Commission, when you take a look at the stranglehold that conservatives have on like local and state politics right now, mm -hmm. the way that gerrymandering is favoring a lot of their outcomes and privileging very, very small, um, high voting population minorities in that party, yes. we can explain not only the extreme swing that we are seeing within the Republican Party, these policies are not popular with most Republicans. Um, Donald Trump is not popular with most Republicans. He's just more popular than Joe Biden. Um, yeah. So, you know, that that explains that 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 very radical shift. But it also, I think, creates a very daunting task. Um, you know, I, I do believe we could pack the court and we've amended the Constitution before, but we got to win some midterms first. And we're going to get to that. And the numbers are fine and looking good. But that's not until November. And this impacts people every day between now and then. And there are people that that worry that it's going to impact them. I think what's really difficult for people that debate this as a question of moral principle or simply policy to really wrap their brain around is that for a lot of folks, this is life-saving care for them or someone that they care about. This is access to a college education or not. This is the ability to continue to work in the job of their dreams or not um, because yeah. of things that have very little to do with choices that they have made. This is existential. This is an existential threat to life and liberty in this country, and it's going to persist every single day. Yeah, and we can talk about the um, the political outcome of this. You know, there there are Republicans who believe it's going to actually strengthen them. I actually don't believe that. I drove by the courthouse um, this afternoon. I saw young women there. That yes. is a change because yeah. the last um, um, pro-choice rally I attended a couple months ago, it, almost everybody was over fifty. I right. think it hadn't really set in. I think there's an understanding now of young women as to what this means. And um, if you galvanize young people uh, and they start coming to the polls and organizing, that's it. They, they, this is, um, this is um, a new game. Yeah, we're going to touch on um, some of the polls coming out. There's a Salon article that I'm sure you saw that talked about, um, you know, all the new numbers that we're seeing. And it ends by saying that abortion has been a fairly low polling issue for Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that that note is antiquated right now. Yeah. 
Yeah, because it was it's right. never going to happen. Yeah, most people didn't think it was going to happen. They had a lot of faith in Roe, and um, that faith was, you know, I think well placed. I think a lot of people are upset that that more was not done, and that makes sense. But we need to give a lot of credit to the people that fought for Roe v. Wade. That thing was a dam that held back a tide for a very very long time. And as terrifying as it is right now, it doesn't do any good for the people experiencing it right now. It is worth understanding that something like that can in fact create liberty. And it can, in fact, create rights. And that's that's what it takes in this country to do that. Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate and frightening. But you're right. I think the demographics are shifting. This will bring young people out. Young liberal men care about this issue and they will vote for this issue. They will show up and they will protest for this issue. We're seeing it nationwide right now. Yeah. Later on, I want to talk a little bit about it because we've been thinking that inflation was going to be the issue that kills the Democrats. But inflation yeah. is a reality that is set in. It's, right. it's now everybody's day to day reality. It's not yep. nobody's shocked about it anymore. And it's probably not going to get worse and it may get better. It's not going to be back down to 2% by November, but it's not going to probably not going to be up at 8%. Things, you know, so and 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 also maybe people are kind of smart enough to by now to realize that there's only so much a president can do about it and that we're like on the scale of all the countries around the world, the industrialized countries, we're not actually the worst off, not even close, right? You know, so right. they so they might figure that. Biden is not doing well in his approval ratings, but we'll talk about that later too. So it's just it's yeah. um so this is they have this has energized um and I'm kind of amazed with that decision being leaked. They didn't change much of it at all. Nothing. It was they just went with that same language. And I was shocked. Language. Yeah. 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 And then really Clarence intense. Thomas said, Oh, we're coming for the rest. Anyway, we'll be talking about this a lot more. But um, yeah, I mean, it's just it, it, history. We're right at a turning point in history here. And I hopefully. Sitting... Sorry, Scott. Eric. I don't want to interrupt you on this, but if I could just put one more note in right here. The phrase that keeps coming to my mind is Supreme Court Justice Merrick Garland. And I know that that is a phrase that means nothing because he is not a Supreme Court justice. But that was a stolen election uh, or sorry, a stolen Supreme Court appointment. And if he were sitting on the bench, this would not happen. And, no. and there are consequences for those kinds of behaviors. And he is now the person in charge with determining whether or not the DOJ is going to indict the first president in United States history. And he's wringing his hands. He's like, will this divide the country? It's like this seems like a losing fight from the left. They need to get a little more militant. All right. Well, we have to move on to the next topic. One of the worst, most damaging decisions in modern history. We could pass a law to protect every woman's right to an abortion, and we should do that. If this turns out to be the opinion of the court and it's issued, it uh, could have a major impact on the outcome of this election. Whoever committed this lawless act knew exactly what it could bring about. So whoever did this leak should be prosecuted and should go to jail for a very long time. This has shaken the independence and the ability of the judiciary to function. If the rationale of the decision as released were to be sustained, a whole range of rights are in question. All right. Well, that was one item of big news. I mean, we've had a bunch of big items of news, earth shaking news. I mean, any one of these stories could have been seizing the headlines. Um, and, uh, and one of them, we're just not even going to be able to cover. We're not going to be able to cover the gun news this week. We're going to have to talk about it next week and, and the week after. But we are going to talk about the January 6 hearings, which have become explosive and I thought we were going to be talking just about the incredible testimony last week about the what happened with the uh, Rosen and the others who were, you know, were having to deal with um, Trump trying to install 
Clark in as you know an environmental attorney with no relevant DOJ experience <laughs> so that he could basically declare the election uh, corrupt uh, so that they could basically shut everything down so he could declare martial law or whatever his goofy plan was. And they basically threatened to mutiny, threatened to resign in mass and, and told him that uh, not only that, but AGs across the country would resign. And only then did Trump back off of that plan. And it was remarkable. Remarkable as to as to the testimony, and these were Republicans telling us this. This were this is these were not radical left wing people. I guess pe some of the Trumpers would probably say deep state or whatever. You know, right? It's just, or clones. Um, or clones. Oh yeah, that they, they thought right. I know. Um, and then we thought that was it until July, right? Because we're waiting. There's a, they're coming up. They're going to be testimony about Trump, um, uh, and, and and they're going to do side by side what was going on with the Capitol uh, riot with what he was doing minute by minute. But all of a sudden, um, we had um, the um, the testimony of yesterday of of a young woman um, Hutchinson who. Um, gave us remarkable testimony, which may or may not have been truthfully related to her, but was remarkable of uh, basically what sounded to me a assault and battery that um, the president may or may not have committed against um, a uh, Secret Service agent because trying to keep him safe because he wanted to get to the Capitol. Um, and so, you know, it's just um, uh, amazing. But he but Deb, but even more important to the story is that he wanted to let people with guns through. Um, uh, into the crowd and, and saying, well, no, no, they don't want to do me any harm, but they, okay, they didn't want to do him any harm, but they might have done officers harm. I, it's just, it, or the, it, it's the, 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 the members of Congress that were certifying the election that they planned to challenge. Yeah. Might yes. have done harm to them. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't, Aaron, um, is there any, and then even before that, we had the testimony of the uh, well, we we talked a little bit about last week of the of the um, threats uh, to election workers and to um, and of course Bowers who says that he would still vote for Trump if it was up against Biden. I, mm. I, I learned later he's running for office, so I guess he's got to hedge his bets. But I, I don't know. The guy's um, off the, his rocker, I think. But um, that's the note that really struck me, Eric. That that one there. Here is someone I was talking about this right before we started the episode. Here is someone that is testifying to Congress that a sitting president is asking him to lie about an election, just lie. And he would still vote for that person before he voted for Joe Biden. That's yeah. where we're at with party. Well, that's politics. where we're at. And it's yeah. like if he wants to understand why his daughter is being threatened with, you know, vulgar sexuality, he should just look at himself to understand yeah. how much he's been brainwashed um, or how much he's willing to play politics to get elected. And he can understand the phenomenon. But that's just not that we, we aren't talking about a self-reflecting type of a state of mind. So the, these are the hearings. But he testified. But then, all, of course, there was the mother and daughter who worked for the Elections in Georgia, who stopped? Um, you know they uh, they've got one hell of a lawsuit. I don't know if Giuliani has any money, but basically they were threatened uh, and the rest. But they also probably have a pretty good movie deal, uh, yeah. I'm sure. So you know they'll they'll probably be fine if they aren't. They'd have to get in us. line behind Dominion, I think. Yeah. 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 I mean, so anyway, um, Aaron, what do you want to talk about first? I mean, there's so much. Well, just touching on what you mentioned, Eric, the, 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 these have been really riveting. I'm really impressed with the ability that they have um, to really simplify the story, to, to break down every single part of the effort from meddling with the actual vote count itself to pressuring the people that were certifying the elections to then creating the event on January 6th on purpose to pressure, if not stop Congress um, and the vice president from certifying our next president. They're really breaking this down um, in, in very very simple steps. I've been weirdly one of the people that's celebrating Liz Cheney's role in all of this. Like, I, I am, but she really is a person of principle. 
it has she, become that. Yeah, she it has. Can her too. Yeah, I think that that, <clears throat> that she, um, I, you know, I've continued to say that I think she's got a pretty good chance of being the first woman president of the United <laughs> States, and I know her poll numbers do not speak to that in the last couple of months, but we're starting to see some movement there. Um, you're not seeing the dyed in the wool like QAnon supporting Trumpists move on this because they're just not watching it, and if they watch it, they're saying it's edited or cloned or CG or something like that. But January sixth did shake a lot of Republicans that voted for Trump. And it sh- and, and these hearings are being shown to a lot of people that are watching them because they're fairly riveting. They have nine of them planned. Uh, they did five of them and said they were going to take a break. And then Cassidy Hutchinson was the sixth. Um, the takeaway for me from Hutchinson, I think, really is that, that – that, and I think that this can be substantiated. I do not think they would put her up there and press her on things that cannot be substantiated or corroborated from other places. I think her talking about Trump lunging for the person's clavicle, that was explicit hearsay. But in other instances, they're talking about discussions she is having in public in the tent where the yeah. president is saying that he does not believe that armed protesters are going to harm him and that he does want them to march to the Capitol. She is yeah. saying that he is in a room surrounded by people and presumably recording machines saying things like Mike Pence may deserve to be hung. And if this is the case, this is a crime of epic proportion for a president. Like Jefferson Davis could only dream of having such capabilities from his seat in Richmond. Like he had absolutely no potential to do this. And because he was the person nominated to be a Supreme Court justice, and that would make it look like party uh, politics and all of this. But um, this is just historic. Woodward and Bernstein were on CNN. I'm sure you saw that talking about how yeah. this just dwarfs um, what we saw with Watergate. Like Watergate, they were breaking into a hotel. This is a president of the United States being told that there are armed protesters and he is telling them to march to Congress to interrupt the certification of an election that he lost. Yeah, I, I go on <clears throat> to right wing forums like in Facebook and the rest, and I try to gauge it. And for a while, they're like, not watch it. No, no, boring. No, no. This is, right. you know, just blah, blah, blah. And now it's starting to trickle because, you know, see, this is the thing. They keep saying, oh, the ratings were low, only 20 million people. You know, <laughs> Biden had 37 million people inside. And I keep trying to point out this isn't the old days of television. Right. This is it's all going to be people are going to be watching snippets, you know, the the stuff that gets sent to them in emails, the clips here and and there. It's it's not it's not about what you saw the other night. And nobody there's no way people are going to pass up the opportunity to watch at least the, 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 the good parts of yesterday that everybody's going to want to hear that. What, what did she say? You know, what did they say? Or just it's, there's no way there, there probably going to be nobody who's a, has a computer. Who's not going to hear at least part of these really wild right. parts. It's just, it just isn't going to happen, you know? And so it's just, and so it's going to have an impact and all they can say is, Oh, they're lying. They're lying. They're lying. They're lying. Oh, she's got, uh, you know, Stockholm syndrome, or she's been bought off, or or she's a clone. That's what so one person said about right. Trump's daughter. She's a clone, Ivanka. I mean, right. what else do they got? You know, it's just it's a uh, it's a deep state. You know, blah blah blah. You know, it's just it has gotten uh, gone bonkers. Oh, they're de- they're trying to detract from how bad a, a President Biden is. You know, and it's just I mean, that's all they've got. There's there's no facts and. Um, and um, William Crystal basically said, yeah, they've got counter programming, but they've got no counter facts. And, and, and you look at the Fox News people and they were stunned yesterday. Mm-hmm. They, mm-hmm. There was like about five seconds of silence. They didn't know what to say after her, they had the clip of her testimony. And finally they said, uh, does somebody want to say something? I mean, it was just like they were – it was really awkward. They tried to avoid covering it completely, and they could not because it's very interesting. Like, it's riveting. Yes. They've got yeah. all of the players. They've got except for the people that are sitting on subpoenas or pleading the fifth, and even the the clips where they're showing people, the the clip where Liz Cheney questioned Wesley Clark about whether he believes in the peaceful transfer of power, and he turned and he his camera off for like three minutes and sits yeah. there and thinks about it, just deeply concerning. Yeah. Um, that is riveting. That is riveting yeah. to see this kind of thing, and you can't keep off of that, even if you're Fox News. I don't know it will move. I said it, it may move some voters. I don't know it will have a critical impact on the election or midterm or anything like that. If this doesn't lead to some kind of criminal charges, it's going to feel like much ado about nothing. There, 
but are his experts. history at least is satisfied with it. Yeah, there are a bunch of experts who, until yesterday, said they didn't believe that Trump uh, could be charged. Right. Who have now changed their minds after yesterday's testimony. Well, and the little tiny tidbit that really tantalized me, because like I really do think a lot of this is about playing a game with the people that are refusing to participate, is what she said at the end with regards to the allegations of witness tampering. She literally said that they have phone numbers of people that are contacting witnesses and arguably tampering with them. And that would mm-hmm. be a second wholly other like large yes. magnitude order crime that if that could be traced back to the president, that right there would be uh, the former president. And that right there would be enough to, to consider, you know, major criminal activity. And I think that it's fascinating that they kind of left it that way. It's interesting because they have the ability to call these things into session whenever they want. And they tell us that they're not coming back to July. And then, bang, they're back here right away with Cassidy Hutchinson yeah. telling us all of this stuff. And so I feel like there could this is the kind of thing that they're planning very, very strategically to kind of try to blindside people, to put pressure on people that are sitting on subpoenas and refusing to comply. And that, to me, was like, there's more to come. I am very interested to see where that comment ends up. Well, you notice the way they did it, too. The night before, the day before, they said, oh, we're going to have another hearing. And they didn't say who it was. They had everybody guessing, you know. Right. Uh, Was it going to be Eastman? Is it going to be Meadows? And all of a sudden, they they had her. Network television could (laughs) dream for this kind of, like, (laughs) speculation. You get it? Like, you could have a appearance on Seinfeld, and they're not going to get that kind of hubbub in the 90s. Like, this was a major deal because it was like, who are they going to bring on? (laughs) No, it was – yeah, there were pools – I mean, it was hilarious. Um, no, I, you know, I, I mean, it, it, it's pretty amazing. Now everybody's waiting for July. I mean, it's just, um, I, you know, or it's tomorrow amazing. they could call another witness to like, I keep thinking, you know, who knows who's going to come out? <laughs> well, they're taking depositions and right. the, and, and I'm wondering if Eastman's going to jump ship because um, right. they're, they're probably going to throw him under the bus. Or I Meadows. Mean, Those are the two that I feel like they're really pushing right now. Yeah. I just mean, the, the way I, that they were saying, like all of the, it was something that they said at the end about like all of the cowardly men that are hiding behind this in one of the CNN interviews or something that was like a lot of people are pressuring the folks that are sitting to speak up. I, I it's just, yeah, I, I mean, where do we go with this? And I'm really curious too. Now, going back to the testimony about the ter- attempted takeover of the DOJ, I mean, that's pretty big. Yeah, I definitely want to touch on that. I have no idea who Jeffrey Clark even is. And I know a lot of people are like, listen, we don't know a lot of names like Merrick Garland and things. But I am a debate coach who's been doing this for a very, very long time. And I know who like Wesley Clark is. And I know who Howard Dean is. And to someone like you, that's probably not very surprising. But for most Americans, these are names that are long since gone because we just don't pay attention to politics in this country. But everyone on Earth had to Google Jeffrey Clark because here is a person who just was like a total no-name person in the Department of Justice. And the one takeaway from this that that does give me a little bit of satisfaction is Donald Trump is famous for like just firing people that he doesn't like and cleaning house whenever he's not getting the results he wants. Public office does not work that way. Here we have a bunch of overqualified people working for way too little money doing work that they, you know, just believe in. That's what they're there for. The Department of Justice is primarily staffed by people that do the work because they think the mission matters. And that means that if you do something like this, the, the, the quotation from the week is you're going to be running a graveyard. And that turned Donald Trump around that kind of mass resistance at the public level. You know, I'm not a huge fan of the Department of Justice. I think there's a lot we could take them to task for. But that kind of spine in a public institution is necessary to stand up to an autocrat. And I'm glad to see that those folks there, you know, Rosen and company had that capability to do that. That gave me a little bit of faith. Yeah, you know, Trump actually thought he could fire Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House. <laughs> not not that he could take her out of Congress, but that he could actually uh, unappoint her as Speaker of the House. He thought that yeah. was a cabinet kind of a position, and he was <laughs> apparently really upset when he learned that he couldn't. I mean, it was just you know, this is all of this, the the stuff that just goes on and on. I mean, um, and then his comments. I mean, you know, he he just went on a, a, a tirade um, the, ever since. I just I you know I don't know who his attorneys are these days but they must be freaking out right um 
it's uh, I mean, where where is this going to go? I, I I don't know what Merrick Garland is thinking. He's under a lot of pressure right now. He did say he's watching these things. Um, I, I know he wants to get the transcripts. I don't I don't understand what the whole um, you know thing is between why the January sixth committee doesn't want to give him the transcripts. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. I I haven't really read up on that. Right. Um, but um, but if he wants to give him the transcripts, you know, my thought is give him the damn transcripts. What's going on there? But um, you know, anyway, um, there's there, there's some issues there. But you know, the FBI raided Clark's house um, the the day before in his yep. PJs. So yep. something's going on. And he's refusing again. He's one of those people pleading the fifth, pleading the fifth, pleading the fifth. And um, it, it's very shocking to think about what what would have transpired if that would have happened, not only in terms of all of the re- people leaving and resigning in mass protest, but just what would have happened if the Department of Justice would have released that letter with the signatures of the other people or not on it, corroborating what Trump was saying. Um, yeah. Pretty much everyone has framed this as a constitutional crisis because if that were to happen, then we can either, one, preserve the notion and the mission of the Department of Justice as wholly independent and non-political, or two, acknowledge what this is, an abject lie, and call it pure you know, party politics. And that would have created a real strain in terms of just like how do we talk about the problem? How do we go forward from here? Um, just a real crisis point that we did not even know about. And the mayor was definitely intoxicated. There were suggestions by, I believe it was Mayor Giuliani, to go and declare victory and say that we won it outright. It was far too early to be making any calls like that. Um, ballots, ballots were still being counted. I don't know that I had a, a firm view um, as to what he should say uh, in that circumstance. The results were still being counted. Did you ever share, Mr. Kushner, your view of Mr. Giuliani? Did you ever share your perspective about him with the president? Um, I, I guess, I, yes. Tell me what you said. Well, basically, not the approach I would take if I was you. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> last topic. Um, we're talking. We're going to discuss um, the poss- the battle for the Senate. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about the Biden effect, about the fact that Biden is so low in the polls because of inflation, Afghanistan, oil prices, that Biden's approval ratings are in the tank and he's going to drag down the Democratic Party with him. That um, that this is a midterm election and the first midterms of after the, pre- the president wins, his party always suffers. Actually, it's not the, always the case, but generally speaking, it is. And that is the 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 wisdom uh, is that the the party in power is supposed to lose seats. And we'll talk about the House another time. That's another story. There's a lot going on there, and Democrats probably will lose the House, but we'll see. It's still it's still early to tell, and a lot of things can happen um, before then. The Democrats, you know, for instance, did not do as badly in terms of redistricting as everybody thought they did. So we'll see. Um, But the Senate is a totally different story. Everybody thought it was a done deal that they were going to lose the Senate. Um, But some things have happened. For one thing, the Republicans have really bombed in some of the choices they've made for candidates. Particularly, they have to blame a certain ex-president, Trump, for insisting and backing certain candidates that were probably not the best candidates to choose. Um, And secondly, um, the Biden effect, if there is one, does not seem to be rubbing off on certain candidates, on, on, on the Democratic candidates. They don't seem to be having effect, at least in some of the crucial states. And not only is it, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen. The, the, the polls the polls are not guarantees of anything. And, it, and, and, and in fact, even if they're accurate, they're just snapshots of what's happening now. They don't guarantee anything about what will happen in November, months from now. Um, but polls, 
There is no Trump effect in off years. The, the, the polls in 2018 were actually fairly accurate, um, as opposed to 2016 and 2020, when pollsters just couldn't figure out what the Trump effect was. In 2016, they did pretty badly. 2020, they tried to account for the Trump effect, but apparently people just who in polls just don't like to admit they're going to vote for Trump, and they didn't couldn't figure out a way to account for that. Well, in uh, in in the in 2022, uh, Democrats don't seem to be doing pretty well in a lot of polls, even though Biden is not doing very well. And uh, we're looking at some polls, and it, it, if these polls are accurate. Not only will Democrats not lose the Senate, they may pick up a couple of seats and in a couple of surprise seats. And I think what we have to look at is um, that maybe voters don't necessarily vote by party or vote by a party affiliation of the president. Maybe sometimes individual candidates make a difference. Who the can who the Democratic candidate are is, who the Republican candidates is, what the state is and what the dynamics are in that state. And maybe party isn't all that necessarily important all the time. Um, and we're going to take a look at a poll that just came out today in Georgia. Um, and it's a quinn Quinna Quinnipiac uh, University poll. It is a gold-rated poll um, and actually trends conservative more than more than other polls, not quite as conservative as like the right wing or pardon me, the Republican um, Rasmussen poll, but more so than, you know, um, Politico and other uh, other polls, even more so than Fox News poll, which actually tends to be liberal leaning in a lot of its polls. It went in, in uh, January, the last time they did the Senate poll, it was uh, a pretty even actually. Um, Herschel Walker, who is the um, Republican nominee for Senate, former um, football player, very popular guy, um, was uh, had 49 to 48 percent statistical tie. He, now, uh, Warnock, the incumbent uh, elected two years ago in a special election, is ahead 54 to 44 percent. Now, Herschel Walker has been caught and some, you know, people are learning about him, about some issues he's had, domestic violence. Um, he's railed against absentee dads. It turns out he's an absentee dad of four children with several different mothers, um, you know, that he didn't quite disclose while he was ranting against others. Um, we've got polls in in Pennsylvania, Fetterman well, well out in front over Trump point to Dr. Oz. We've got Tim Ryan doing fairly well against um, Vance, um, you know, in, in um, there. And oh, shocker, incumbent um, Ron John, Ron Johnson in Wisconsin, who bought into the big lie early on, is slightly behind um, Barnes, who is the vi or not vice, um, what do you call it, uh, lieutenant governor um, candidate who's the most likely to be a Democrat could possibly lose in Wisconsin. If everybody else holds, and Mark Kelly seems to be doing well, and so far in Nevada, and the Democrats are holding there, and in Colorado, Democrats could pick up votes in the Senate. There doesn't seem to be the, Biden. And meanwhile, just real quickly, and then I'm going to turn it over to you, Aaron, um, in this place where Herschel Walker is 10 points ahead, um, Biden is down, I believe it's like he's down to like 33% in approval rating in the, with the same polling sample. 33% approval rating for Biden, 54% support for um, Warnock, the candidate. No correlation. Aaron. Right. I think that's a really good note. And I think that um, when it comes <clears throat> to contemporary politics, especially when it comes to politics that have been endorsed um, by candidates like Donald Trump, you're seeing a new, very anti-establishment and very kind of celebrity-oriented um, politics. This is ironic for people that were Obama supporters and had to sit through a bunch of folks that voted for Ronald Reagan uh, telling us that we're voting for a teleprompter president that is kind of a celebrity. But what has happened now is that you have this kind of cult of personality that is Trumpism. And that cult of personality, as we have just said, is not very robust across the entire party. Definitely not right now. I think the January 6th um, hearings, they may not be moving a critical mass of voters, but what they are doing is kind of continuing 
continuing to polarize the Republican Party in much the same ways the Democrats are being polarized, but I think in ways that are um, um, much more vehement, in ways that that um, are much more anti-establishment. And one of the takeaways from the testimony that we did here over this last week was one of the um, folks that used to work for Fox News saying that their numbers said that a bunch of people went and voted for everyone except for Trump. They voted for senators. They voted for House people. They just did not vote for Donald Trump, and that's yes. the reason that he lost. And I think that that shows you that that down ballot logic that we have depended on for so long in this country, the very lazy voting of Americans just picking a party and voting the slate, may not be as predictable um, as we have thought in the past. And when you have candidates like Oz or Herschel Walker, um, I think it's likely that you may not see the party standing behind those people as much as we would expect. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at Center for Politics, they say that there's basically six states that are going to be up in the air. Um, and they say that Arizona – sounds like the pups are pretty pumped up about this. Yes. It says Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania are the ones that are going to be the closest. These contests, um, they say, should be regarded as toss-ups. The other three races, North Carolina, Nevada, New Hampshire, these are expected to be especially close. Four of the six contests that are expected to be competitive are currently held by Democrats, so they have more dice to roll, which mm -hmm. means they have more to lose. The other two, North Carolina and Pennsylvania, are held by Republicans. The only other bit that I'll get here um, while your dogs are carrying on would be that there's also a uh, CBS News poll that came out on Sunday that shows that half of the Democrats, half of the Democrats that they polled said that Roe v. Wade makes it more likely, the repeal makes yes. it more likely that they're going to vote. That's an astronomical number. That's a huge boost. Only 20 percent of Republicans said that Roe v. Wade made them more likely to vote. The very same poll says that 28 percent of independents are more likely likely to vote because of Roe v. Wade, and 63% of independents are upset with the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, which yes. means we could see a huge wave of blue voters coming out in uh, November, which is absolutely necessary if we're roll. Which could affect the House race, too. That's why I'm not even saying that's settled right. matter. Yeah. Right. I, I want to point out uh, there's also a big difference here. Warnock wins the support of women 61 to 37 percent, while Walker wins men 52 to 45 percent. Big difference there. Women are galvanized and they're going to be turning out um, this time around. Um, and but it's but where he really wins it is because it's um, Republicans and Democrats are pretty solidly behind their candidates. But independents are supporting Warnock 62 to 33 percent. That's where he's killing it. Whereas Stacey Abrams, where it's pretty even between her and Kemp, it's uh, mm -hmm. she's only got like a 10 point lead with independence. And that's what's helping her break even there. She's got to really work on that. She will probably get a boost from the row thing. Well, that's um, Absolutely. And, 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 and a lot of other things. Exactly. I mean, uh, but this but there's a lot of other particulars. You got to look at the races too. Tim Ryan has got that Sharon Brown working class appeal that works for Ohio. He, mm -hmm. he you know, he's a Democrat. But um, but his opponent, Vance, is a writer, kind of an intellectual. I mean, you got to pay attention to details in the in, in these things. Will he have that appeal for Ohio? Everybody says, oh, well, he's a Republican. Ohio's a Republican state. And they don't look at the details of these kind of races. Oz is kind of odd. You know, is he, does he does he kind of have Fetterman's got that kind of blue collar appeal? Yeah, he's a Bernie Sanders guy, but Bernie Sanders has that working class appeal for some reason. You know, mm -hmm. it's just uh, whatever it is he's got, he's got it. Um, you know, it's um, uh, it it um, it's just you know you, you have you have to look at the particulars. You got to look at the particular state and, and and case. It may not have always been the case, but right now it does seem that people aren't. Party loyalists, at least at least for a good percentage of, of voters in the Midwest. Yeah, because Wisconsin is taking everybody by surprise. It's not taking me. I've said on this show that that could be open because Ron John really bought in to the Trump thing. And he, I, I thought he was making a mistake because Wisconsin is not Oklahoma. I thought for sure you were wrong about that, and I'll just eat crow right here on the air and be like, it does look like Wisconsin's up in the air. And I'm pumped. I'm excited to see it. 
And, you know, it is not a silver lining because, as I said at the top of the show, the, the row repeal is something that's going to impact people's lives with existential dread every single day. But this is the kind of a wave that we needed in order to stave off that kind of a defeat in the House and the Senate that we were facing um, because it's, you know, there's there's a lot up for grabs as far as Democrats are concerned. And um, I do think this will galvanize people, and I, I still think that the party vote on the left is stronger. I think people are less likely to reject individual candidates. You don't see the mm -hmm. same kind of celebrity endorsement of candidates right. that are trying to eat their own young going on in the left. You get folks like Ocasio-Cortez who are rightly dissatisfied with the direction that the party yeah. is going, and they ultimately fall in line. Um, it's just a very different dynamic, and so I think that conservatives are rightly worried about the 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 chances that they were really excited about just two weeks ago as far as the midterms go. Yeah, I I mean, you know, I think if the Democrats have to worry, I think their their weakest link is Nevada. They got to worry about Cortez uh, Masto against uh, Laxalt, who is popular there. She's not polling that badly. Um, you know, she's doing OK, but that's that they have to worry about that. I'm not convinced that Kelly's in any kind of trouble in Arizona. And I have not seen a poll um, where the incumbent is in any trouble in Nevada. Once they lost Sununu there, I think the Republicans lost a chance. I'm not Nevada, um, New Hampshire. Once right. uh, once they lost Sununu as a candidate, I think they lost any real chance in New Hampshire unless something really bad goes for the Democrats there. So I think the Republicans best chance and they're probably going to throw a lot of money in there is to win in Nevada but um and I, and with the row I'm not sure I'm just not sure that um you know I think I the, I don't know that women in Nevada are going to be in any mood to not turn out for a woman candidate so we'll see how the dynamics work there cuz I just um you know I I don't I, I don't see it and uh, I mean uh, Val Deming in Florida is within single digits I mean I don't know that she has a real chance to take out Rubio, but it shouldn't be that close, you know, right. in, in Florida. I mean, so, you know, I'm, I don't I don't think that. And then, um, you know, I, I mean, we're not talking about governor's races today, but I'm really I'm curious to see what the Texas uh, polls are look, going to look like with Beto and Abbott later. That I mean, really, really got my attention. Like, yeah. I, I, it's such a drastic change between the two of them and such a close race. Like, it's fascinating. But I just don't think I don't think Biden is a factor. I just he don't, seems you know. to be fairly out of like um, the conversation as far as the politics of it all go. Um, pretty much everyone's agreed he's a lame duck president, except for him at this point. Um, yeah, so. I don't even know what if he's I mean, he's say I think he's just saying uh, that he's going to run just because he has to. Right. He doesn't want to lose any legitimacy as the current yeah. president. And so for at least the next year, he's going to insist that he's running. And if he keeps insisting after that, I'm going to get worried. But yeah. up until then, I think it's very pro forma. But I, I mean, I could be wrong. I don't see him hitting the campaign trail nearly as much um, as I would expect. And maybe it's a little soon. And a lot can happen. There's a lot right. that can happen between now and these midterms, and there's a small part of me, given where we're at, where we're at with party politics in this country, that worries that maybe the news story isn't the election itself, but the reaction to the people that lose it, insisting that it's fake, insisting you get it, like we could sure. just have a whole other round of this. Um, I don't know. We'll see. All right. Well, we we have to move on to the the last segment of predictions. <laughs> All right, Aaron, what have you got for us? Well, uh, I kind of touched on it before I came on, uh, on, and I told you about it last time that I was here. My prediction's pretty boring. This new gun law that everyone's really excited that we just got passed, my prediction yes. is that it's going to be struck down by the Supreme Court. Really? Absolutely, even, yeah. Even though it's bipartisan. Absolutely. The, the, the court doesn't care. The Second Amendment is an individual right. The most recent Supreme Court decision says you can't make special needs to take away. There's no special needs for the First Amendment. So there would be no special needs for a firearm. I think that that directly implicates this law. The fact that both of them happened the same week to me is kind of like hilarious. I think that Mitch McConnell knew that. I think Republicans know that. I hope I'm wrong, but that's my prediction. What do you got Interesting. for us? Interesting. All right. Well, that would... Uh... Wow. <laughs> okay. It's so mild. Why would they bother? But it, Because of where we are right now. I mean, they just are so rabid with that Second Amendment thing right now. So I don't know. We'll see. 
All right. I'm going to, I want to try to make a prediction. It's a long term, but I believe it's one that will be verified by the end of the year. Uh, we were just talking about how Biden will not run. So the question is, who's going to run uh, and who will be the standard bearer? Um, you know, there's a lot of talks about um, uh, the our own governor, a lot of talks about, um, you know, people, uh, right, uh, you know, Rohan, uh, Kohan uh, down in, in, in be, being the new Bernie standard bearer. But I am making a prediction here um, that uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who is looking really strong right now in the polls, she is crushing her opposition, partly because half of them just tripped over themselves with uh, fraudulent signatures and got <laughs> out. But uh, but she is just soaring in approval ratings and uh, just absolutely crushing it. Um, she's and and it, again, she's in a state where Biden's down in the 30s in the approval ratings, but she's soaring. Um, she's walking on water. They love her. Um, and um, I and, and I think she's throwing out hints. I think that um, that they will be talking by the end of the year and after the November elections, when they start talking about it, that she they will talk about her as the possible front runner should Biden step down. That's a bold prediction. I've said on this uh, the show here that I am uh, in Newsom Abrams camp. That's my pick. But um, I think that's a good one. She's with, she's with, definitely crushing it up there. Whitmer is. Yeah, for sure. And with Roe going down, it's right. got to be a woman. And well, and she's ferocious. Like, I mean, she's not as like fierce as some of the other folks that we see up there in the Midwest from the Democratic Party. But um, like she put up with a bunch of people that were going to like kidnap her and things. And she right? is still doing the politics like she's not backing down. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good name to watch. And those guys are still out there because they messed Absolutely. up the prosecution. So Absolutely. Yeah. And again, she's just up in the, the ante. So I think that's a, a good name to watch. All right, we'll be discussing all of this in the future. Until next time, stay informed and stay engaged.